Okay. So now it's Stephen Azzi. Azzi. Yeah. Okay. My, fa my father's Italian. The Zeds perform the same function that they do in pizza. Okay. I might leave that in. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Stephen Azzi teaches history at Carleton University. That's all you've got is a bio on the uh, on the book that we're going to talk about, Walter Gordon and the Rise of Canadian Nationalism, published by McGill Queens. That's it. <laughs> anyway, uh, prior to academia, you worked with uh, various politicians as an aide, and uh, your research focuses on prime ministerial leadership, Canadian US relations, and Canadian nationalism. Welcome to the bibliophile. Well, thank you very much, Nigel. I'm glad to be here. So as I mentioned, we are here to talk about Walter Gordon and the rise of Canadian nationalism. I'll just read out the uh, summary of the book here. It's an examination of the origin of Walter Gordon's nationalist ideology and its impact on Canada. It traces his ideas from his family influences and the intellectual currents present in his early years to his work as a chartered accountant, public servant, and head of a small conglomerate. Stephen reveals Walter Gordon to be an unlikely nationalist whose dream of a country controlled by Canadians continues to reverberate. And that's exactly what I want to do. I want to reverberate with you. <laughs> Certainly. <laughs> so... Gordon was a politician, a public servant, a very successful businessman, and a Canadian economic nationalist who was at his height between 1958, you suggest, and 1963 when he introduced his budget. He was concerned about the degree of foreign U.S. ownership uh, of the Canadian economy, which had uh, ramped up post-war uh, and especially during the 50s. In the budget, he proposed some measures to correct this, as well as in a, a royal commission that was uh, named after him and conducted in the mid-50s. Were his measures or proposed measures feasible? Isn't that a good question? So one of his measures, his proposed measures, was a 30% tax on the takeover of Canadian companies by foreigners. And it never came to be, in part because it wasn't well thought out. Uh, how do you administer a tax like that? Gordon had never bothered, at, bothered asking that question. So the, the wise thing would have been to consult with the heads of the major stock, the stock brokerages, to consult with the stock exchanges. How would we uh, administer a tax like that, but Gordon never did. And so when he brought in the measure, when he introduced it in his budget, uh, there was an immediate outcry and he was forced to backpedal. And he, he said that he was just temporarily withdrawing the measure until the difficulties could be ironed out, but he never reintroduced it. And I think it was because it wasn't all that well thought out. Yeah. In fact, uh, Eric Cairns, the head of the Montreal Exchange, came in and blasted him in the paper and in person, right? Right. And the irony to that is that Kieran's later enters politics and comes around to the Walter Gordon point of view. Yeah. And there's, a, there's a moment where Kieran's gives a, a public speech and Walter Gordon happens to be in the audience and Kieran's leaves the platform and goes to Gordon and says, see, Walter, our views are cut, becoming closer and closer. And Gordon responds, yes, and I haven't moved an inch. Well, Kieran's... It sounds to me like he's a lackey for American companies when he came in and, and crapped all over Gordon. Yes, yes. I think the interesting thing here is that it was hard to draw a distinction in those days between the Canadian companies and the American. Uh, the Canadian companies weren't keen on this either because they wanted to be able to sell out to Americans. If you, if you ban the Americans or you limited the ability of Americans to buy Canadian companies, that suddenly devalued all those Canadian companies. The fewer buyers you have, the less something is worth. So yes, Kieran's is speaking for, for American corporations, but he's speaking for Canadian corporations too. That's interesting, isn't it? And what we're saying here is, well, is the Canadian elite 
Yes. Yes. One of the things that Gordon simply proposed was that U.S. Uh, subsidiaries divulge how much profit they were sucking out of the country. Yes, and I think I think this is one of the first steps to dealing with the problem is to get information, and we didn't then have a lot of good information. Um, but how to are we going to get that? Well, I think I think requiring companies to divulge information, whether they're foreign or domestic. Uh, whether they're public or private, uh, is absolutely essential. There was something called the Corporations and Labor Unions Returns Act that required companies and labor unions to, to divulge who their officers were, in the case of corporations, who their owners were, where dividends, dividends were going, and so on. And that information could be made, you could apply to the minister for a small fee, and they would provide you with that information. That was done away with, I think, in the 1990s. And it's a real shame. And I, I might add, uh, this is a grievance of mine, all these documents, 300 boxes of them were turned over to the Library and Archives of Canada, which proceeded to destroy them. So if you're a historical researcher, you can't go back and find out about uh, these old companies and what, what they were up to. That's disgraceful. It is. It is. Okay. If we didn't have any facts then about how much American companies were making in Canada, then what were all of these positions based on? <laughs> Good question. I mean, we did have some facts. Uh, I don't think we knew enough, but we had some facts. We knew Statistics Canada keeps track of how much of Canadian industry is domestically owned and how much is foreign owned, for example. This would have been in the 50s. That's what I'm this, talking this, about. Yeah, and they, Statistics Canada began keeping track of this in the 1920s. So okay. we could see um, that roughly a third of the Canadian industry was owned by foreigners, mostly Americans, and that that number was slowly, very slowly ticking up in the 50s and 60s. So there, there was some acknowledgement of this. The interesting thing wasn't so much that the Americans were increasing their share of Canadian industry, it was that it was becoming more and more concentrated in certain areas. So the areas where the Canadian economy was booming in the 50s and 60s, oil, uh, iron ore, things like that, those were areas where the Americans were predominant. That in particular spooked Canadians to see a booming economy, but all the boom is coming from areas dominated by Americans. Yeah. And so again, how could we possibly know how much money they were making and how much of it was going back to head head office in the States. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. I wish I had a more intelligent answer. No, but uh, I, I haven't I haven't seen I haven't seen the statistics. Um, I don't know that they're out there. There was a, a economist, Ed Safarian, who did probably the, the best empirical research on American companies operating in Canada, but he did it by surveying the American companies. Uh, so he relied on their voluntary cooperation with a survey he sent out. But this should be the role of government, not the role of, of economists at the University of Toronto. That's ridiculous too. I mean, they're not, uh, who, they're not gonna divulge that if they don't have to by law. Yes, yes, some did. Some cooperated. They saw they didn't, weren't ashamed of what they were doing. Others wouldn't cooperate. Did they actually hand over their uh, the truth, the real numbers? I that's a good question. Um, certainly, Ed Safarian, who passed away recently, thought that his information was accurate, but I, I couldn't pass judgment on that. But again, that's just what they told him voluntarily. Yes. Yes. So what's interesting, of course, is that when uh, when Gordon uh, introduces his budget in 1963, uh, he introduces this program. So can you just get into a bit more about exactly what what he introduced in the budget? Sure. The, the biggest part was this takeover tax. Right. Uh, and then there was also some fiddling with um, the tax treatment of dividends, whether a company was paying dividends to residents or non-residents and whether the company was owned by Canadians or primarily by foreigners, he would change the tax treatment. But this, this was Gordon's solution to the, the problem uh, of Americanization of Canada was to, was to go through the tax code. Uh, and for me, that's problematic uh, for many reasons, one of which is 
Canada's in, in an awkward position. We want to benefit from living next door to the world's most dynamic economy. We want to be rich, but we don't want to be American. Uh, and so the question is, how do you how do you thread that needle? How do you accomplish that without frightening away American capital? Uh, and I don't think Gordon had the answer. Um, he was an economist. He wasn't an economist. Sorry, he was he was an accountant, and his response was an accountant's uh, response to the problem. But that would do nothing. You know, you and I have discussed in the past Canadian magazines and Canadian books. What Gordon was proposing wouldn't do anything to help save Canadian magazines or Canadian books or uh, ensure more Canadian uh, programming on on radio and television. No, that's a that's a really odd juxtaposition there. The way he treated or wanted to treat American uh, industry and manufacturers, and the fact that he didn't he he could have done something about culture, about magazines particularly, about Time Magazine and, and Reader's Digest by taking away the credit that Canadian advertisers could get for advertising in those Canadian editions. But he didn't even, he didn't do that. He didn't follow the uh, O'Leary recommendations. That's right. So he becomes Minister of Finance when the O'Leary report on publications has just suggested that um, foreign editions of Canadian or sorry, Canadian editions of foreign magazines be limited or, or, or eliminated altogether. And he doesn't do anything about it uh, to the point that the prime minister's office actually seizes the file from him and they, the government proceeds, but without the, the, without action on the part of the minister of finance, which is very unusual. So the government does put an end to these foreign uh, magazines, creating bogus Canadian editions uh, with an exemption for for the two longest standing uh, versions of these magazines, Time and Reader's Digest, but it wasn't Gordon who did it, and he thought that it was pointless. That, that's bizarre. It is. It is. What, what explains that? I don't think he ever quite understood the importance of culture in this matter. I think he he, he was a man who understood money and he understood power, but he didn't get culture. Yeah, but there's no skin off his nose if he does it. No, there wouldn't have been. It's it's this odd thing. It's it's one of the paradoxes, one of several paradoxes of Walter Gordon's life. I just I find it really difficult to understand the this this sort of difference in treatment. Yes. Of American companies. And and, and after unless after was, sorry, unless sorry. he was upset, unless he didn't like the people at McLean Hunter. I don't know that there was any personal animus there. I've never come across any. After, after he leaves politics, he becomes head of something called the Committee for an Independent Canada, a lobby, a, a nonpartisan lobby group. And when they put out their list of priorities at one point, uh, Canadian culture is down about 44th on a list of 46 priorities. It, it, wasn't, it wasn't a priority for him or the people around him. And yet at the same time, he was good friends with Jack McClellan at McClellan and Stewart, who published several of his books. He was very close to Mel Hertig at Hertig Publishers in Edmonton. So he had friends in that realm, um, but that's not how his mind worked. And, you know, his father was an accountant as well. Um, he grew up in the family firm of Clarkson Gordon, and maybe that's just how his mind operated. Well, I would think that and this is no disrespect intended, but he understood how business and the economy worked better than an academic. You know, yes. He was dismissed by all these academics, these professional economists. He understood how the economy worked. Yes, absolutely. It, so, he had so the practical knowledge. The, the economics profession then, and I must say now, is very much dominated by a particular point of view. It's a, a free trade, small government point of view. Uh, and Walter Gordon ran up against that, not just on his views on foreign investment, but his views on, on social policy as well. It needs to be said that Walter Gordon's one of the, the fathers of uh, the Canadian, of many of Canada's social programs. Uh, if he hadn't been Minister of Finance, I don't know that we would have had Medicare when we did or the Canada Pension Plan. Um, he, he was a very odd individual. He was a Minister of Finance who said yes when people came to him with proposals for more spending. <laughs> well, he'd be at home in today's government. <laughs> yes. 
that. Yeah, these professional economists love to point out that, quote, he had no formal training in the subject. Yes, yes, absolutely. And, and I might add, for a while, the, he was very close to the Toronto Star. And when he first got involved in, in government and politics, the Toronto Star kept referring to him as the economist, Walter Gordon. And I think that really irritated the university economists. Yeah, but he, as I say, we, he, did, he was involved in royal commissions and studies and all sorts of really kind of hands-on. He knew, I think he knew Canadian business better than almost anyone else. I, I don't doubt that. And he had worked during the Second World War. He had worked in the Department of Finance. He had worked for something called the Foreign Exchange Control Board. Uh, he had chaired two royal commissions, one of which looked into the Canadian economy. Um, he was very, very well read. Um, he might not have been a professional economist, but he read their works. And then, of course, he, he has its own company, Canadian Corporate Management, which by the 1970s is one of the top 100 companies in Canada. He knew how to work the system. He was extremely wealthy. Yes, absolutely. And yet you say that his measures to discourage foreign investment in Canada were, quote, ill-considered. Uh, I do. I do. I think he came up with these solutions. He never tried to convince anybody. Uh, this is the fascinating thing. He brings in this budget, but that 30% takeover tax that I mentioned, that hadn't been part of the Liberal platform. Uh, that had never been discussed in Cabinet. Uh, he had discussed it with the Prime Minister, who Lester Pearson, who knew very little about economics, had a very shaking understanding of economics, wasn't even very good at managing his own money. And I think when you're bringing in, when you're making change, you have a national debate. You win people over. You explore the weaknesses of your, your own ideas because it makes them stronger. But that's not how he functioned. He had his ideas. He knew he was right. And he, he bowled ahead and suddenly hit a brick wall. And there was, no, there was no way around that. But I think if he had spent more time Debate, engaging others, uh, and this comes to, to the question of what is effective political leadership. Um, a lot of people think it's declaring a point of view and, and charging ahead. I think consultation is an essential part and, and collaboration and compromise is an essential part of political leadership. And I think when you do that, you get measures that last. And when you don't, you get measures that can be easily overturned by the next government. Yeah, he, I think he thought and acted like a businessman and he was irritated with all the all the bullshit he had to put up with, with politicians. Exactly. Um, he was very ill-equipped as a business person for the, for the, the games of bureaucratic Ottawa. You now, you, you say here he was faced with, when he introduced his budget and his measures, uh, he was faced with widespread opposition and hostility in the House of Commons. And, and you also suggest that Canadians weren't supportive. And my sense is that this is all choreographed by American big business. Maybe not choreographed, that's too strong, but definitely strongly supported behind the scenes. No, oh, I don't doubt that the Americans reacted. The American corporations reacted very quickly and very vigorously, as would have the American government. Um, but I think there was a, a backlash too from the Canadian business community who considered Walter Gordon to be a traitor, a traitor to his class. A traitor to profit making. Yes, yes. Uh, and I might add, this is a government that that's, has a minority in the House of Commons. And so it's vulnerable. Yeah. And so it's, it's not just the Conservatives who attack, the NDP attacks as well. Uh, not because they necessarily agree with Gordon's objective, but beca because they see a wounded minister who they might be able to, to kill off. Uh, and so there, there's an attack from all sides. Uh, and poor Walter Gordon, who hadn't won over his cabinet colleagues, is left alone in the House of Commons to defend himself. Yeah, it's pretty savage, isn't it? It, it was. It was. And it was, it was unfair. They attacked his integrity. Uh, and if nothing else, this was a man of, of utter honesty um, who lived yeah, by unusual, a, a very strong unusual, code of conduct. Unusual for a politician. Yes, absolutely. Another thing is, and I, again, I, that's why I suspect there was a, a kind of a concerted effort from American money. There's a frequent reference to this budget and the whole thing as a fiasco. 
when all he's doing is trying to exert Canadian independence? Yeah, a, a political fiasco in the sense that these measures are brought in and he has to withdraw from them um, and he sort of limps away. The government had just come to power um, 60 days, less than 60 days earlier, and all of a sudden their first budget is, is, has to be taken apart bit by bit. Gordon up until that point had, had a very strong reputation. Among other things, he, he ran a company called Woods Gordon that specialized in helping corporations become more efficient. So he was considered the country's leading expert on efficiency. And here he is with a budget in shambles and, and trying to revise it on the fly. Uh, and it did a lot to damage his, his reputation for, for omnipotence. Yeah, I, I mentioned before we, we went on here that I picked up some McLean's magazines from the period. And this one here is actually a year later. I just want to quote from Blair Fraser's backstage in Ottawa column here. He said, just a year ago, Parliament witnessed the most spectacular personal fall in Canada's political history. Until then, Walter Gordon had been regarded in liberal ranks as omniscient and infallible, and even the opposition viewed him with something approaching all, blah, blah, blah. After three weeks of withering attack from the press and the business community, his career seemed to have ended in ruin. But then this article goes on to say that he rebuilt his reputation within the year. I don't think he did. I think he, he, he certainly did a lot to recover, but I don't think he ever fully recovered. Um, just to, to cast back for a second, 1958, the Conservatives under Diefenbaker win the largest majority in Canadian history. They should have been able to govern for a decade on the momentum of that victory. But the Liberals cut them down to a minority in 62 and then throw them out of office in 63. The campaign chair for the Liberal Party was Walter Gordon. And so Gordon, Gordon has a huge reputation because he's one of the key figures in ending the Diefenbaker regime. He's a great uh, he, organizer. He's a, he is the best organizer. Uh, he is the, an incredibly talented recruiter and just a very efficient uh, delegator of authority. Um, so he, he walks in to the House of Commons in 1963 with this budget as, you know, as I mentioned earlier, the, the top efficiency expert in Canada, but an amazing political or, uh, organizer to whom many of the Liberal members of Parliament owed their careers. They wouldn't have been elected but for Walter Gordon, particularly the Liberals from Ontario. And he, he never quite recovers that after the budget. And when you look at his subsequent budgets, they're all fairly pedestrian. Um, there's nothing radical about the subsequent budgets. Yeah, he's being tamed. Yes. Yes. I can't help but believe that he knew what he was doing. Everyone says, you know, there's this idea that uh, he had no formal training. I think he knew what he was doing. And I'm surprised that you're, you're attacking him. So what you're saying, going back to my initial question, is that his, his, his proposals weren't feasible then. You don't think that we could have bought back Canada? I, I don't know. <laughs> I know that's a, a limp answer, but I really don't know. My main concern is whether that was the correct approach. I have yet to be convinced that a Canadian capitalist is fundamentally different from an American capitalist. Yes, and this is what he based a lot of this on, isn't it? That Canadian businesses would do what's best for the country rather than the bottom line. Exactly, exactly. I don't know that it's the business of government to save the wolves of Bay Street from the wolves of Wall Street. Uh, and when you look at people like Conrad Black, I have to wonder, you know, Conrad Black just finished a fawning biography of Donald Trump. I don't know that I want Conrad Black to be defending Canadian interests and Canadian values. Yeah, I think that was another problem, wasn't it? And it comes up in the Gordon Commission itself, where one of the researchers, Young, I think his name is, suggests that the Canadian tariff cost consumers a lot of money. Yes. Yeah, I believe I believe Young's estimate was that it cost consumers something like a billion dollars, a phenomenal amount. It seems to me we, we do have reasons to want corporations to behave in a certain way. But the solution might be for the Canadian for the Canadian government to create incentives for companies to behave that way, whether they're Canadian owned or foreign owned. Uh, I'm not I'm not coming at you with any specific proposals, but as far as general approach, I think Gordon would have done better that way. 
You know, we want Canadian companies to seek out export markets. We want Canadian companies to use Canadian parts and Canadian components in their manufactured goods. Uh, we want Canadian companies to have Canadians on their boards of directors. Certainly, well, let's provide financial or tax incentives for them to do that, rather than saying uh, American companies stay out, Canadian, only Canadian-owned companies can operate here. Yeah, but how about we want to own our own country? Well, absolutely. Uh, certainly, my preference is to have Canadians own Canadian companies. But then the question is, at what cost? So, you know, the big Alberta oil boom came about because of uh, American companies. Uh, oil exploration is very expensive and very risky, and Canadians weren't doing it. So Imperial Oil and others came in and did it. Um, the same with the iron ore in, in Labrador and northern Quebec. Very expensive to find it and to develop it. Canadians weren't doing it. And thank goodness that some American companies came in and did it. So the, the question is, where do you draw the line? Uh, you know, we, we do need some American money. Absolutely, my preference is to have all that done by Canadian capital, but I'd rather have it done by Americans than not done at all if it means Canadian jobs and, and a higher standard of living for Canadians. How come the Canadian companies or government together didn't do it? Uh, Canadian capitalists are notoriously risk averse <laughs> compared to Americans. It might be that even the Americans, in country. even in their own country, it might well be that the Americans just have a, a lot more very rich people than we do. Uh, and so they're willing to take risks that our, our capitalists won't. You mentioned that, that Gordon resigned in 65 because he, he wasn't able to produce a majority for the Liberal Party. And then he wrote a couple of books or a book and gave a bunch of speeches across the country, which uh, provoked a confrontation with the then finance minister, Mitchell Sharp, at the 1966 Liberal Party conference, where Gordon was soundly defeated. Could you talk a bit about that? Sure. Uh, so he resigns. He resigns in 65. He, he had pushed Pearson into calling an election. When the election failed to produce a majority for the Liberals, Gordon resigned. I don't think he should have. And I don't think Pearson should have accepted the resignation because ultimately it's Pearson's decision to call the election, not Gordon's. And Pearson should take responsibility for that. But he resigned. I don't think he expected his resignation to be accepted. And so when his resignation was accepted, uh, I think he was deeply hurt. He and Pearson had been close friends for many years. So I think he felt betrayed. And then he's sitting on the back benches. A man of Walter Gordon's stature doesn't get involved in politics to sit on the back benches. And he decided, essentially, he wanted to make some change. He wanted to to spur to to provoke some sort of confrontation so that he was either brought back into the, the cabinet or he would leave politics altogether. So he he starts campaigning to get his ideas accepted by the Liberal Party convention in 1966. This is something I should mention that he should have done before he brought in his budget of 63. Yeah. Win yeah. over your own party first, right? Yeah. Yeah. Um, and what what it turned out that he just didn't have the numbers. People loved Walter Gordon as an organizer, they didn't buy into his political or his economic ideas. So he, as I say, he was soundly defeated at the convention. I forget what the vote was. Um, he later said it was because his people weren't well organized and the other side was well organized. That may be part of it, but I think, you know, Walter Gordon's a good organizer. I, I think the issue was more that he hadn't convinced his, his own party of the value of his ideas. So after that, he's now, he had thought that this would you know, change his party and maybe bring him back into cabinet. So then he announced that he was going to leave politics. And at that point, his friends uh, in the party rallied around and convinced Pearson, you have to bring him back into the cabinet. We can't afford to lose Walter Gordon. So he, he returns to cabinet. And this is a fascinating chapter of his life. Pearson invites him to back to cabinet. And Gordon says, I'll come back if you make me deputy prime minister. <laughs> Right. <laughs> and, and Pearson says, well, <laughs> we don't have that in Canada. In those days, there was no deputy prime minister, but I'll give you the, the powers of a deputy prime minister. I'll put you in charge of the Privy Council office, which is the prime minister's government department. Uh, I'll make you in charge of handling, um, of coordinating the, the business of cabinet committees, and uh, I'll make you liaison between cabinet and liberal party. And he gives them all these powers, or he promises all these powers. And when Gordon returns to cabinet and says, okay, where are the powers? 
Pearson says, oh, well, you know what, I hadn't really understood this won't be feasible because of X, Y, Z. Uh, and Gordon never gets the, the position that he was promised. So he ends up resigning again a uh, little over a year later, this time quite with quite a bit of, of bitterness towards the prime minister. I just can't believe that Canadians didn't support owning their own frickin' country. The polls show that that begins to change around the time that, that Gordon leaves politics in 1968. And I think, to be fair, I think it was because of Gordon. I think he convinced the public, but he only began the, the process of persuasion after he had left after he had left office yeah. or after he had yeah. left the, the Department of Finance anyway. Yeah. Uh, and so you see that, you know, this question, is there too much foreign investment in Canada? You see the, the answer in public opinion polls, the answer yes in public opinion polls consistently increasing. And it really only peaks in the early 70s, uh, yeah. long after Gordon had been gone from elected politics. Well, the, the, I do want to go back to, uh, to 63, but but the sad, sad thing is that as a result of his work, they bring in the, the Canadian Development Corporation to, to help purchase companies to keep them Canadian and, and FIRA to evaluate purchases by foreign entities. Uh, but they introduced them, but they're kind of toothless. And, and since then, it's been a bit of a joke. Yes, yes. So FIRA, I mean, Gordon wasn't the minister who brought in FIRA, but no, Gordon but he, was... He, he, he as, as we've said, he went out and campaigned probably better than he ever did when he was a politician. Exactly. And so in that sense, as a private individual, he helps convince the, com the country and, the, and by extension the government of the importance of bringing in something like the Foreign Investment Review Agency. Um, the problem is if the government doesn't really believe in it, and it's clear that Pierre Trudeau's government didn't, they're not going to use that agency the way that Walter Gordon had wanted them to. And so it, it, by the end of the, the Pierre Trudeau regime, FIRA is approving 99% of the proposals it receives for foreign, takeovers or foreign takeovers of Canadian companies. And then the, mo in fact, they had already been talking about changing it from the Foreign Investment Review Agency to Investment Canada, which would yeah. encourage foreign investment when they were defeated by the Mulroney government and the Mulroney government then brings that in. But the idea was already floating around in the late Trudeau years. Yeah. You're getting back to the, the criticism of his policies to, to help make Canada Canadian again. There's this outspoken, and I find it so ironic, economist, uh, academic, Harry Johnson. He's a Canadian, but of course he teaches in the United States. Yes. And he points out this basic contradiction. The commission, this was actually, yeah, criticism of Gordon's commission in 57, but also of his budget. He shows some symptoms of schizophrenia. On the one side, it looks with favor on the protection of manufacturing and processing industry. On the other, it presents the American investment in Canada, which is largely a result of that protection. Yes, yes. And this is this is a thing, this is a problem with Gordon. The reason American firms set up branch plants in Canada was to get around our high tariff, the tariff that dated back to John A. McDonald's period. It was too too expensive to export to Canada. So you set up a factory in Canada and produce the goods here. Uh, Gordon certainly believed in a higher tariff. Um, he had had companies that had struggled in competition with Americans, particularly in, in the textile industry. So on the one hand, he's in favor of a higher tariff, but on the other hand, he doesn't like the foreign investment that's in Canada. And I think the two of them are closely related. And incidentally, later, when we talk about free trade in Canada, one of the complaints of the, the anti-free trade movement is, well, all those American companies are going to pull up stakes and move back to the United States if there isn't a tariff. So they started arguing in favor of, or, uh, in favor of the tariff to keep the American investment here, which gets back to my, my earlier point about this difficulty of threading the needle. We, we want the American capital, but we don't want to become American. Yeah, yeah. Okay, this is this was crushing for me here. This is the beginning of chapter three, Man and Superman, 1958 to 63. Okay, 
in the late 50s, uh, there were good years for Canadian corporate management. That's his company, right? Yes. And uh, in the spring of 1959, Cancorp, as it was often known, sold six companies to Canadian, this is so ironic too, Canadian International Papers, which of course is an American company, a subsidiary of American-owned international paper company, among them were, et cetera, et cetera. So having argued strongly against foreign ownership in the Royal Commission, Gordon's decision to sell these companies to an American firm is surprising. I was, I was stunned when I discovered that. Uh, and I, I hate yeah. to say it, when I, when I was mentioning earlier about the National Archives destroying documents related to ownership, ownership records, I wanted to see how many other times the Gordon had done that. Um, I've come across two cases. There are six companies you mentioned, and also uh, he had set up the Canadian branch plant for Motorola Company, which later went on to be a major cell phone producer. You say that uh, he helped Motorola to attain a foothold in Canada and later used to establish dominance over Canada's cellular telephone market. Yes, yes. So the with the paper companies, the six paper companies, Gordon's defense was that they produced particular types of paper that uh, very few other companies produced in Canada, that international paper wanted to get into that field and came to him and said, you either sell us those companies or we'll create our own factories and go in direct competition with you. And that there was no way Gordon thought he could compete with this giant um, Canadian international paper was owned by International Paper of New York. And so he felt like he had a gun to his head. Yeah. Uh, in the case of Motorola, he just made a lot of money. <laughs> he had license to set up Motorola Canada with an option of selling it to the parent company at the end of a certain period of time. And he did and, and did very well. So I think, yes, Gordon, you know, the first occasion he had a gun to his head, but he also made a lot of money. And the second occasion, he certainly made a lot of money. Um, so this is this is the thing you see you see the situation differently depending on where you sit at the table. If you're the one with a company to sell, you you see American investment very differently than if if you're an economist or or a, a politician or a nationalist or a nationalist. I find that sad, really. It, there's another example of this, a different. This is a, a book by Sandra Campbell on uh, the Ryerson publisher, uh, uh, Lauren Pierce. He, he, uh, yes. he was caught plagiarizing at one point. I was crushing. Yes. This is just like that. Yes. That's, that's an excellent book, Sandra Campbell's, by the way. And I had the, the pleasure of interviewing her about it. Oh, wow. Yeah, it was great, really. But this is a similar... <laughs> This is a similar thing. It's pretty disillusioning, but I just can't believe it, though. That's the thing. I want to believe in Walter. Yeah, it, it was very difficult for me to figure this out. I think, I think ultimately he thinks we should make a sacrifice to maintain our Canadian identity, but only so much of a sacrifice. Yeah. Well, there's certain thing to be said for self-interest. You got, you know, and he, he made a lot of money, as you say. In fact, here we are. Uh, you say on page 68, one of the ironies of Walter's life is that he made a substantial amount of money by selling Canadian enterprises to Americans. Uh, this is this. Yeah, this is Gillespie. According to Gillespie, this quote, a very basic inconsistency was well known on Bay Street and likely accounted for much of the anger generated toward Gordon when, as a politician, he tried to limit American ownership in Canada. So he's being accused of being a hypocrite. Yes, yes, absolutely. He, in those days, there was a phrase that was widely used, the price of being Canadian. Yeah, and this was... There is a book on that, exactly. And it was a way of framing the debate. How much are we willing to pay? What, how much of a lower standard of living should we accept for, for maintaining our identity? Um, and I guess Walter Gordon, in a sense, answered that <laughs> in how he managed his businesses. He was certainly willing to pay a price, but not too steep a price. Well, that's the thing. He, he didn't want to get it to get in the way of him making a whole hell of a lot of money. Yes, yes. 
What do you think of, uh, this is Simon Reisman, a negotiator on behalf of the Canadian government for free trade, but he was involved as a researcher on on the Gordon Commission, the U.S.-Canada study or report. And he said, if I've ever met a protectionist, he's a protectionist. (laughs) So Reisman was... um raised on the old school of, of Canadian economics. He, he was a believer in free trade. He held it as an article of faith. Um, and Gordon wasn't. And the two clashed from the beginning. Uh, Reisman had an explosive personality. Uh, he was as mercurial a character as you could meet. Um, I don't know if, if, you know, you can edit this out, but I, I remember for this book interviewing him in his office in Ottawa, and it was phenomenal. He had the biggest personality of almost anybody I've ever met, uh, a foul mouth. Uh, he was only about five feet tall, but he wouldn't sit down during the interview. He paced back and forth in front of me and occasionally would put his face up to mine and bellow something into my, my face. Like a, bull, like a bulldog, right? <laughs> absolutely. Absolutely. Okay, so yeah, I'm, I'm just trying to swallow this disillusionment. Yes, I I came at this, uh, to give some background, I came at this uh, as somebody who was and still considers himself a nationalist. That's why I was attracted to Walter Gordon. When I was a student, I had been a member of the Council of Canadians, which has changed quite a bit since since then. But in those days, it was a nonpartisan nationalist organization. It's become more of a leftist lobby group in the in the meantime. But I, I believed in Gordon's cause. Um, but I was troubled by, you know, the inconsistencies that we've just mentioned. Uh, I was very much troubled by his lack of interest in cultural matters, which strike me as absolutely essential. Um, and I worried the whole time about what price we were paying for these measures. You know, I know a lot of people who, who work for American-owned companies who might not have a job, but for those companies. Um, and I come from, I, I'm not from Ontario, I come from British Columbia, and I know that outside of Ontario, there's this sense that when Ontarians use the word nationalism, they're really talking about Ontario's interests, not the interests of the rest of the country. Yeah. And, and there are lots of places. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. There are lots of places in the country, you know, talk to somebody from the Maritimes that would love to have some American investment, if it means factories and jobs. Yeah. Now, on the same page, uh, the beginning of chapter three, Man and Superman, 1958 to 63, you say his policies were generally and widely embraced. The only exception was his position on foreign investment, which the party and the Canadian people had not accepted, a fact that Gordon never fully understood. Um. What's your proof of that? Well, the proof is what happened in in 63 when he breaks in the budget. Um, And nobody, hardly anybody falls in behind him. That's the party, though. His own party stabbed him in the back. Yes. Um, But they they rallied behind him on other issues, you know, on, on everything else that he proposed. If you look at the book that he writes in the 60s, Troubled Canada, you know, he's talking about all these social programs and he's talking these on these measures, people are behind him. But when he, he starts moving into the question of foreign investment, suddenly his supporters evaporate. And when I went around, when I went around interviewing his old buddies, um, they spoke with him with such affection. But when I raised the foreign investment issue, they would sort of shake their head and say, well, yeah, Gordon and Walter, he had this thing about foreign investment. I was not with him on that, but I was with him on everything else. That's because they were bought out by the Americans. In some cases, but there were, there were other people who weren't, um, who, who thought that he went too far with this or that he wasn't taking the right approach to it. I think that Gordon, being in the the position of power that he had, was the last best chance we had at owning our own country. What do you think? I think think that's a fair statement. I don't think there's been any other uh, Canadian politician of that stature who had those views. Now, you look what happened between about 2000 and 2010 or 15. The number of Canadian companies that sold out is just incredible. Yes, absolutely. So 
Gordon suggested that this uh, economic sellout would jeopardize our political sovereignty. Do you think that's true? Has that happened or not? I think we've been remarkably resilient. Uh, we're always in danger of losing our sovereignty, uh, but I think we've done a good job in, in maintaining our distance. Um, I liked that we stayed out of the war in Iraq. I liked that we moved to to uh, legalize gay marriage before before the United States. Um, I like that we've managed to maintain sensible gun laws. That we've managed to maintain a public health care system. So I think we've we those things are always under pressure, and they're not as good as I'd like them to be. But I think we've done a pretty good job of of keeping ourselves distinct from the United States. They have nothing to do with the economy, though. Well, when when free trade came in, there were a lot of predictions that that would mean the end of Medicare, but because the only way we could compete with Americans was by lowering compete with American companies was by lowering our tax base, um, which would no longer make it possible to maintain maintain a, a public health care system. So you could make the argument that there are connections. They're not directly economic, but there are economic elements to all these things. Uh, similarly, with the war in Iraq, the people who, the Canadians who insisted we had to go into Iraq kept saying, we're going to destroy our relationship with the United States. Um, the Americans are going to stop buying products in Canada because they're going to be so angry at us. Um, and, and Jean Chrétien, to his credit, said at the time, make me a list of all the products that the Americans buy as a favor to us that they don't really need. <laughs> and his, his punchline to that story is, I'm still waiting for the list. Yeah. <laughs> Is it worse now than it was in the you know, late 50s, early 60s in terms of dominance? Of, I mean, globalization is around the world. It's happening everywhere. But is it, quote, worse now than it was back then? It's different. Um, so they're, the Americans are less dominant in Canada. They're, they're a proportion of the Canadian economy owned by foreigners is probably about the same as it was then. But the Americans are less dominant. There are a lot more, um, a lot of investors from other countries that are now in the Canadian uh, operating in Canada. And I think that diversification is probably a good thing for us. The big, the big difference is, as you say, globalization. Um, and you know, even Canadian companies are operating in many different places. And sometimes it even makes sense for a Canadian company to have most of its head, head office operations in some other country. So that's another factor that's come into play. Yeah. What, what they called uh, a decade ago, uh, the hollowing out of Canadian head offices. And we've, we've struggled in some areas. You know, I, I was sad to see BlackBerry lose out to to the iPhone, for example, that was a great Canadian product. You called the Gordon report seminal. Why is that? It was seminal in the sense that it, it gave birth to a particular brand of economic nationalism in Canada. Um, so up until that point, economic nationalism in Canada had meant trade protectionism. Uh, the old national policy of John A. Macdonald, where you keep the tariffs up to keep the foreign goods out. Um, Gordon reoriented economic nationalism to focus on, on the issue of foreign investment. Um, and he did so, I mean, he struck at a particular time in, in Canadian history when um, there were doubts about the United States, largely over McCarthyism, when Canadians were beginning to notice the large level of foreign investment in Canada. Uh, and he just happened to be there at the right time. Um, the Gordon Commission held hearings across the country and people showed up to complain about foreign investment. Yeah, that's what I thought. But you say that it wasn't, uh, it wasn't popular back then. There, I think the concern was real and widespread. The, there was no agreement on the solution. That was the issue. And so, you know, you look at the Gordon report, it, it recognizes the problem with foreign investment, but it doesn't really have a solution. There's some vague, vague discussion of possible measures that might be taken. And he, he doesn't go out and, and with a, a specific platform and win people over. The platform suddenly agrees when he introduces a budget in 63. It's interesting you raised the, the kind of the scrap between Gordon and the bureaucrats uh, in the book. And I did now did Gordon, well, I mean, Gordon had a big influence on, on all of it, but 
the preliminary report came out quite aggressively about how bad foreign investment was, right? It was it was fairly strong. It um, actually let me take that back. It it was strong for that period. Yeah. Uh, if you read it now, it's very mild. But I think it was jarring at the time that, that an official government report would come out and, and criticize foreign investment in Canada or su even suggest that there might be problems with foreign investment in Canada. Yeah, I think that's the thing. You know, you don't want to upset the Americans. And the, yes. OK. And, but of course, following that during the 60s and up to 72, uh, this is exactly what was being said quite loudly by by Gordon and his followers. Yes, yes. Um, by Gordon, for sure. Um, his followers are, are a mixed bag. Um, a lot a lot of them are strongly loyal to Gordon, but not interested in the foreign investment issue. Right. Which is kind of how he's remembered. Yes. Yeah. The, the irony is, you know, I mentioned earlier, I, I was drawn to this subject because I was an, I was an am a nationalist myself. The book wasn't supposed to be a biography of Walter Gordon. The book was supposed to be a, a history of that brand of nationalism. But I quickly discovered that there weren't a lot of them. There was Walter Gordon and a couple of other names. But when I started interviewing Gordon's friends and, and allies, I discovered a lot of them weren't interested in this issue. So the, another name you mentioned to me earlier was James Coyne, the governor of the Bank of Canada. He was another strong economic nationalist from this period. But I challenge you to come up with three or four other names, people of that stature who had those views. Well, uh, doesn't this spill over into this whole conversation about how Canada's elite are very closely tied with America to America. And this is how they make a lot of their money. So no one's going to come out in the elite saying this kind of thing. In fact, isn't that why coin was canned? Yes. Yeah. The economic elite, certainly. Coin, the interesting thing about coin is he's the governor of the Bank of Canada, and yet he's not one of those professional economists. He was actually a lawyer by training. And so he hadn't bought into the, the faith that the economists had in free trade. Uh, and he was troubled by, by foreign investment in Canada. But his measures, this gets back to the choice between prosperity and independence, his measures, the government feared, would increase unemployment in Canada. Yeah. And so he's fired because the government is, this is the Diefenbaker government, is desperate to reduce the unemployment rate. And here you have a governor of the Bank of Canada who's fighting a war against foreign companies and in the process is raising the unemployment rate. And how, how is he doing that? It's uh, ba basically a tight monetary policy. Okay, so um, he's and, raising uh, interest rates. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Now, what happened to his son? How come? Uh... <laughs> <laughs> that, that's a mystery. <laughs> the son, the son's much more of a free marketer than the father. That he fell far from the tree. Well, or he just fell in line with the elite. It could be. It could be. I you you'd have to have the son on your program. <laughs> that would be a fascinating that would be a fascinating talk and actually i'd love i'd love to read a biography of james coin there is a book about coin as the governor of the bank of canada but it's not really a biography it's more uh, i guess a, a bureaucratic biography it's what he did as governor i'd like to read a lot more about his childhood and and how he ends up where he, he ends up he comes from winnipeg yeah. very much connected to the canadian elite his best friend was Jack Pickersgill, who was a minister in the Saint Laurent and, and later the Pearson governments. But I, I'd love to know more about him. I, I tried to interview him, but he was quite old by the time I got around to it. And, and I, I, never, I never had the opportunity to talk to him. He's part of the Winnipeg Mafia. Yes. Well, Winnipeg was, was enormously powerful in Ottawa in those days. Mitchell Sharp was another Winnipegger. Yeah. Jack yeah. Pickersgill was from Winnipeg. Um, Sylvia Austry, who was an important bureaucrat, was from Winnipeg. Uh, and when I talked to them about it, why was Winnipeg so important in Ottawa? They told me that Winnipeg was a much more uh, cosmopolitan city than Ottawa in those days. And when I asked, well, how, how can that be? They it's said it's because... Hard. Yeah, it's not hard. But also Winnipeg was the center of the grain trade. So the people in Winnipeg had to understand world trends because they had to sell Canadian wheat. Well, that's where uh, that's where Sharp started off. Exactly. Exactly. Hmm. So are you happy about what's happened with Canada? 
since uh, Gordon's time or unhappy? Isn't that a difficult question to answer? I'm glad that we still have a Canada. I wish I could see more Canadian television programs and watch more Canadian movies. Um, the, the nature of streaming and the 500 channel universe is that it seems to me there's there are fewer options available. Now I'm sure somebody's going to hear this and say, oh no, actually technically there are more, but I don't, I don't find um, that I have, that I'm exposed to Canadian stories in the same way that I used to be. I lament the death of great Canadian magazines like Saturday Night, which I, I love to read. Um, you know, you go back into those old issues of Maclean's or Saturday Night, and you yeah. can find a lengthy, um, in-depth pro profile of senior cabinet ministers. Yeah. You know, I, I know virtually nothing about Christian Friedland or, or Bill Morneau or some of these people who are running our lives, who are running the country and, and having an enormous impact on our lives. And, and I think that's necessary for a democracy, and we, we're losing that. That's not just Canada, though. No, it isn't. It isn't. Okay. Winding down here. So is it impossible for, because I think it's, uh, I think it's quite the, the, uh, the degree of American domination of can, the Canadian economy and culture is uh, disturbing. And why is it disturbing? Um, because it just for, pretty well exactly what you've said. Uh, I want to know more about Canada and uh, the people that lived here, the great people that lived here, the great things that were done. And it just doesn't seem to be happening. So is there a way to make it happen? <laughs> um, I, like they I, put I, a billion dollars at CBC. I and mean, that's the, the number that's always thrown out. Yeah. I'd, I'd like to see, I, I know conservatives will recoil at this, but I'd like to see more of a government involvement. So to give one example, I, I was six years at teaching at Laurentian University in Sudbury, where I taught US history, not Canadian history. And it was a pleasure to teach US history because the resources are so rich. There's so many documentaries and books and, and materials. Um, PBS does an enormously good job of, of teaching Americans about their history. I don't think the CBC comes through in the same way for us. Um, there was that program, I don't know, 10 or 20 years ago, Canada People's History, that was well done. But that shouldn't be a one-shot deal. There should be regular biographies and interesting material on Canadian history that we can watch on television and that can be packaged in, in, and sent off to teachers to show to classes. Um, so I, and it's not going to come from the private sector. Uh, and it's, it's a, we're a small market. You can't expect consumer demand to pay for it the way it would in the States. You can make a documentary on, on John Adams in the States and know that enough people will watch it, that it's worth the while, that it's worth the while of the person who's funding it. But in Canada with one tenth the population, we can't make a documentary on Georges Etienne Cartier uh, of the same caliber. And so that's where government needs to step in if we, if we want to continue to be a country. But just, again, it's kind of a, a broken record, but the CBC isn't doing its job. It, I mean, the CBC has enormous challenges. Uh, I'd hate to be president of the CBC, but I, I, I'm glad the CBC is there. I, I much rather have the CBC there than not there, but there's so much more that I'd love to see the CBC doing. And maybe, maybe the problem is there isn't enough money there. I don't know. Well, all they have to do is to go to the archives, and I've talked about this before, is, and open up all the stuff that's there and put it on online. Yes, yes. It's, it's amazing. You Unless, know, as, of course, they've destroyed it all. As, as a historian, I've, I've conducted research at, at the John F. Kennedy Library in Boston and at the uh, Gerald Ford Archive in, in Ann Arbor, Michigan. And then I go to the Library and Archives of Canada here, and it's amazing how uncooperative they are and how much is restricted. You can't, you're not allowed to see, and they don't have the money for archivists to open up materials, and things haven't been digitalized. It's a real challenge for a Canadian historian. Okay, that's great. Well, we've ended this up by shitting on the archives and the CBC, so this is very Canadian. Yes. So, anything else that you want to say that, that hasn't been raised in our conversation? 
I don't think so. I think we've covered a lot of ground here and we've gone quite a bit beyond the, the scope of the book as well. But it's, you know, I think I think the important thing is we're, we're Canadians, we're proud to be Canadian, we want to save the country, but also Canadian, being Canadian doesn't mean being poor. That's right. We want it both ways, which is yeah, exactly. There's nothing wrong with that. What are you working on now? I'm actually working on political leadership. So I'm working on a book on Canadian prime ministers and how they lead the different leadership styles of Canadian prime ministers since Diefenbaker. Including Diefenbaker. Including Diefenbaker. Excellent. Who's easily the most interesting of them all. That's great, Steve. Thank you so much for uh, taking the time to talk to me. My pleasure, Nigel. It's, it's been a stimulating conversation. Stephen Atsi teaches history at Carleton University in Ottawa. Thanks again. Thank you.